of War Digital Digest. I'm Will. We want to say thanks to the historic Fort Wayne Coalition for providing this space for us to shoot the opening and closing of an episode. And today's biography, this is the perfect place to be. Today we're going to talk about Israel Richardson, the senior most man from Michigan killed in combat during the Civil War. Richardson reaches the rank of Major General. But as a colonel, he leads the 2nd Michigan Infantry at its initial training here at Fort Wayne. Settle back and enjoy some time with us now as we look at the story of Israel Richardson. He was a soldier soldier, a no-frills leader who earned the respect and love of his men. He built one of the finest combat divisions of the war and led it to great renown. Major General Israel Bush Richardson earned a reputation as Fighting Dick in the Mexican War and was one of the rising stars of the Army of the Potomac in 1862 before he was mortally wounded at the Battle of Antietam. His reputation has been overshadowed due to his untimely death, but his loss was a severe blow to the Army of the Potomac, his men, and the Federal War effort. He was born the day after Christmas in 1815 to Susanna and Israel Putnam Richardson in Fairfax, Vermont. His father was a Dartmouth-educated lawyer who became an attorney for the state of Vermont and a judge. He was named for a family acquaintance, the noted French and Indian and Revolutionary War hero Israel Putnam. Young Richardson grew up with the stories of the member of the famed Rogers Rangers, who was one of the toughest of those forest fighters. Putnam was a man who led by example and was a resilient fighter. These stories seemed to have an effect on young Israel for his own style of leadership stress setting the example for his men. Israel Richardson, uh, born in New England, became a Michigander, you know, received or developed a reputation early on after graduating from West Point as being a hard fighter, being in the thick of it. A lot of his commanding officers recognized him as somebody that would be a leader. The Richardsons lived an easy life and were well off. They moved around the state, living successively in Cambridge, Fairfax, St. Albans, Swanton, and Burlington. Israel dreamed of a career in the Army and sought admission to the Military Academy at West Point. A local congressman who held a grudge against the elder Richardson blocked Israel's admission for a year, but in July 1835, he entered the Corps of Cadets. Richardson's time at West Point was difficult. He was never a strong student, but he studied hard and kept his nose clean. In his first year, A bout of mumps got him behind in his studies, and his grades in mathematics suffered greatly. In January 1836, he was allowed to resign from the academy in order that he would be eligible to reapply. Undeterred, Richardson re-entered the academy in July. He continued to struggle in mathematics and failed his examination during his sophomore year as well. His superiors saw something in the young New Englander, however, and retained him to repeat the year. They saw that his potential was more than the sum of his poor grades. In his last year, Richardson earned high marks in conduct and leadership. He was a solid horseman and did well on the drill field. Those grades helped him rise up to 38th of the 52 graduates of the class of 1841. His classmates included Federal Generals John Reynolds, Horatio Wright, Nathaniel Lyons, and Don Carlos Buell. He traveled to Florida to join the 3rd Infantry along with a large group of new recruits. Richardson would time and again find himself dealing with large bodies of new recruits and develop a specialty of working with them. Arriving at his post near Tallahassee, He joined his regiment in the low-intensity Seminole War. For the next two years, they patrolled and skirmished across the state while Richardson learned his craft as a soldier. He wasn't a garrison soldier. All his career, he he was out on the front. And he learned his lessons from a grizzled old uh, captains, uh, the the, the well-experienced NCOs. That was his life. In late 1842, Lieutenant Colonel Ethan Allen Hitchcock assumed command of the 3rd Infantry. 
Hitchcock immediately put his command through a rigorous course of training. Richardson watched this drill master turn the raw regulars into the most professional unit in the army. Hitchcock's skill as a troop trainer and battlefield commander was a model for Richardson. The young officer was learning in the field, commanding his own company during the last months of the Seminole War. In 1843, his regiment was posted to Jefferson Barracks in Missouri. There, Richardson and the 3rd Infantry trained hard alongside the 4th Infantry. He became close with officers in that unit, including Ulysses Grant and James Longstreet. It's a, such a small army, everybody knows everybody. It's the same old story where all these, you know, Grant, Longstreet, Pickett, Richardson, they all they easily could be at a card t poker, poker game together. In April 1845, Richardson and his regiment joined the Army of Observation under General Zachary Taylor. This force soon moved into South Texas, enforcing American claims on the border with Mexico being the Rio Grande. In May 1845, war came to the Texas border, and 2nd Lieutenant Israel Richardson marched at the head of his company as Taylor and his army moved to intercept the Mexican advance across the Rio Grande. During the twin battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, Richardson and the American army fought their first major battles. The climax of the battles was a bayonet charge made by American infantry, including Richardson and the 3rd Infantry. The best troops Mexico could produce were arrayed against us and in a strong position of their own choice. But the last general charge of our entire line with fixed bayonets, they could not withstand and they broke and fled to the river. Lieutenant Israel Richardson. As the nation mobilized for war, Taylor's army grew with floods of poorly trained volunteers. Richardson watched as the badly disciplined men caused havoc and died in droves from disease. Supplies were low, but Taylor prepared the army to strike into Mexico. Taylor was a no-frills soldier, called Old Rough and Ready by his men. He shunned parades and displays of rank, and often wore civilian clothes. His personal leadership endeared him to the volunteers, and Richardson came to admire his commander. So it's really common, I, you know, I speak from experience, as a junior officer, you really start to emulate the senior officers that you serve under. And I think it's really apparent that Richardson emulated Zachary Taylor, who is his commanding general during the first part of the Mexican War. Taylor was famous as old rough and ready. He was unkempt. He was you know, very lax with his men, but he was a hard fighter. And I think it's really apparent that Richardson in the Civil War very much was molded himself on purpose in that image. And I think that goes a lot into his character, how he connected with volunteers. And I think in the same way Zachary Taylor as a regular army officer in the Mexican War uh, was thought of much better by volunteer soldiers than, for example, Winfield Scott, Old Fuss and Feathers, despite Scott being a brilliant general. In September, Taylor led his army in an assault on the fortified city of Monterey in northern Mexico. The 3rd Infantry led the assault on the east end of town and suffered brutal losses. Officers fell in great numbers, including Richardson's company commander. Richardson and Company H got split off from the 3rd Infantry and ended up for a time fighting alongside the 1st Mississippi Rifles under Colonel Jefferson Davis. Together, they shattered a charge of Mexican Lancers before the assault was resumed. The fighting was disjointed and house to house. Command and control on the regimental level was impossible and it became a fight of companies. Richardson's pugnacity and quick thinking distinguished him in the fighting. Over half of the officers in the regiment were killed or wounded on September 21st. Richardson earned his promotion to first lieutenant that day. Though he had been in action before, Monterey proved to be a watershed experience for him as a soldier. He had been through some of the most difficult combat of the war and emerged with a reputation. After wintering in northern Mexico, Richardson and the 3rd Infantry joined Winfield Scott's army that landed at Veracruz in March 1847. 
Following the fall of the fortress, Scott took his army inland to Mexico City. At Cerro Gordo, Richardson led his company in a bayonet charge on a stone wall and redoubt on top of the hill in the Mexican center. About half his men were new recruits and were seeing their first battle. Richardson led his company from the front and was noted for his personal bravery in inspiring his men. In the melee, Richardson and his men captured a Mexican gun and turned it on the defenders. His brigade commander, Colonel William Harney, ordered him to take the gun and break up remaining Mexican resistance. The charge of Harney's brigade broke the Mexican center and caused the collapse of their entire line. His actions had influenced the outcome of the battle and Richardson received attention at the highest levels. Army Commander Winfield Scott personally coined the name Fighting Dick for Richardson after the battle. In August, Scott cut his long supply lines and advanced on Mexico City, intending to take it and end the war. Richardson led his men through 36 hours of combat during the battles of Contreras and Churubusco. During the climax of the fighting around the convent of Churubusco, the 3rd Infantry captured the remnants of the San Patricios, the Irish Catholic battalion with many U.S. Army deserters in its ranks. In order to get into Mexico City, the Americans had to seize the fortress of Chapultepec, towering 220 feet over the surrounding countryside. Richardson volunteered for the storming party from his division. A heavy cannonade from all our batteries was commenced at daybreak and which was continued at 8 o'clock in the morning and when the assault commenced, our party followed the road under a terrible fire from 4,000 infantry and five pieces charged with grape. And although losing three officers and 70 men and killed and wounded, nothing could stop us. It was over in an hour. With the fall of Chapultepec, Scott launched his army against the walls of Mexico City. They breached the gates and took the city after hard fighting. Richardson was given brevet promotion to major for his role in the fighting. With the end of the Mexican War, the 3rd Infantry returned to its peacetime role of guarding the frontier. Richardson helped establish the garrison in El Paso, Texas, where he met Rita Stevenson. Richardson was taken with the woman of mixed American and Mexican heritage, and the couple wed on August 3rd, 1850. Later that year, Richardson went east on leave, where he was promoted to the full rank of captain while still maintaining his brevet rank of major. Early in 1851, he returned to the frontier with a large party of recruits for the army in the southwest. Returning to El Paso, Rita went into labor and died in childbirth. Richardson had little time to grieve, for he soon took command of his own post, Fort Webster, deep in Apache territory. Finding his fort surrounded by several hundred Apaches, he held a parley, but fighting erupted. While he was never punished for the incident, it reflected poorly on Richardson. It was at that point that he heard the news that his son, who was being looked after by his in-laws, had also passed away. Richardson suffered from depression and felt isolated at his small post on the New Mexico frontier. His new commanding officer, Dixon Miles, was erratic and a petty tyrant. Many officers in the regiment resigned due to his mismanagement. In June 1855, Richardson traveled to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to take charge of a large party of recruits. Less than half of the untrained men were armed, and they were short of supplies. This was made worse when an accidental fire destroyed much of the clothing, food, and ammunition. Richardson kept the men together through the march, but upon reaching the next post, got into an argument with the more senior post commander about a point of army etiquette. Fed up with the frustration of life on the frontier in the peacetime army, and weary from the loss of his family, Richardson resigned his commission. After about 12, 13 years, he decided to hang up his officer's sword and, and move to Michigan, Pontiac, Michigan, where the rest of his family had, had eventually moved, and took up farming. It's, he's the type of man who uh, could put down his officer's sword belt 
and pick up the reins and walk behind a plow all day long uh, working the field. Richardson enjoyed a quiet life with his extended family and their new home in Pontiac. As is the case with many wartime veterans returning home, he had some trouble adjusting to civilian life. He did become engaged during this time. With the beginning of the Civil War, he offered his services to the state of Michigan. Governor Blair sent fellow West Pointer Orlando Wilcox to interview Richardson and look into rumors of his odd behavior in Pontiac. I soon found that Richardson was so far from being insane that he was as sound as a nut. But he was louchy and slovent, something of the style of cadet that Stonewall Jackson was, and also quite absent-minded. He went about Pontiac looking queer, perhaps, and certainly unsociable. But in talking over old times, the Mexican War, and the coming strife, I found him clear and alert and up to the occasion. Colonel Orlando Wilcox, 1st Michigan Infantry. Governor Blair appointed Richardson colonel of the 2nd Michigan Infantry. Once the men rendezvoused at Cantonment Blair and then moved across Detroit to Fort Wayne, Richardson went to work training his militiamen into soldiers. Richardson can back up everything because he's lived a life. He's hard on his men. It's not a uh, popularity contest. He's going to train them hard. If the men understand that, and that goes to even today, you know, if you're being, if you can look at your leader and know that he's he's got your welfare at heart, he's you're working hard for a reason. Uh, he's sacrificing just as much as you. He takes the time to know your name. He takes the time to uh, laugh and joke with you. Those are the kind of guys that are very successful. You know, you 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 will die for someone like that. As the regiment prepared to go to war, Richardson was thrust into the public spotlight. He publicly split with his fiance over him signing up for a three-year regiment. Richardson walked across the street and offered himself to a woman he had only met a few times before. In less than two weeks, Richardson and Frances Traver were married. May 30th. Colonel Richardson was married yesterday morning. The effect was excellent. He was never so pleasant before as at battalion drill yesterday. He said no less than three times that we did well, a thing he never did before. Sergeant Charles Hayden. On June 8th, the regiment departed for the war. When he arrives in Washington with the 2nd Michigan Infantry, he's met by General Scott, um, who had uh, commanded him in Mexico and had been aware of his reputation of Fighting Dick and was very happy to see him and exclaimed, I'm glad to have Fighting Dick here um, with me. Richardson built a reputation as a drill master and was asked to help improve other regiments as they prepared for their first campaign. When the 3rd Michigan invited him to drill their regiment, Richardson drilled them for three hours at the double quick, bounding up and down the unit, bellowing instructions and reprimanding officers. Richardson assumed command of a brigade in early July, including his own 2nd Michigan. Erwin McDowell's army moved slowly towards Manassas Junction. On July 18th, Richardson's brigade led the advance and was sent to reconnoiter Blackburn's Ford on Bull Run. And Richardson, being the aggressive guy he is, took his brigade out and got involved in a skirmish at Blackburn's Ford. If it's not a defeat, it's a draw, where he uh, runs into a brigade or two of Confederate troops, and actually led by um, James Longstreet, his old buddy from the, from the old war, or the, or the old army. Richardson deployed his brigade to cross the creek, and when one of his regiments, the 12th New York, began to retreat, he rode into a mass of men and began to rally them when General Tyler arrived on the scene. While Richardson wanted to take the remainder of his brigade forward and seize the high ground south of the creek, Tyler ordered Richardson to break off the advance since he had achieved his objective of fixing the Confederate position. The rebels advanced, and a sharp skirmish continued on for some time before both sides pulled back. During the Battle of Bull Run three days later, Richardson guarded the Federal left under the temporary command of his former commander, Colonel Dixon Miles. Several officers, Richardson included, accused Miles of drunkenness during the battle. He ordered Richardson from his commanding position to the rear. 
Exasperated at Miles' increasingly erratic behavior, Richardson began placing his troops in the best positions possible. When Miles complained to the army commander, McDowell relieved the drunken colonel and placed Richardson in command of the army's rear guard to cover the retreat. Following the battle, Richardson was promoted to brigadier general. West Point trained officers were at a premium, and Richardson had already demonstrated himself a good drill master and instinctive battlefield commander. He set himself to work on training his volunteer troops. Well, you know, a lot of regular army officers at the beginning of the war had trouble connecting with volunteers, shaping them. You know, they had such rigid ideas of discipline and handling regular soldiers, regular army soldiers was just different than handling volunteers. Richardson's tact was a lot different. You know, he had experience in the regular army handling large amounts of recruits. You know, at one point he commanded a, a battalion of recruits marching out west to be replacements for the various posts out there. And there was no basic training. So this was a mobile mobile basic training group for the army. And I think that really gave him a perspective on how to deal with recruits that a lot of other West Pointers didn't. You know, he's a very gregarious guy. He'd go around the camps, he'd talk to guys. He would really try to relate with them and really appeal, understanding these are volunteers in a wartime. They're not regular army soldiers. You know, these are very motivated, often from higher social strata. And I think that he was really successful and able to connect with those guys in a way most West Pointers could never do. Yet Richardson was anything but a soft touch, as the 12th New York discovered. When the regiment refused to turn out for drill, claiming their enlistments had expired, Richardson turned out the second Michigan. He ordered his former regiment to load their muskets and fix bayonets before the errant New Yorkers relented. He also engaged in army politics. Richardson scorned fools or those he thought of as timid, his aggressive spirit attracted the attention of powerful politicians. The senator from Michigan, Zachary Chandler, and, and Israel Richardson become, become friends. I'm not saying they're cozy friends, but they do have communication. When uh, Chandler wants something, he goes to Richardson and gets the information. When Richardson needs weapons or something is lacking in the, in the logistics, or he'll let Chandler know. His new patron was only too happy to use Richardson in the ongoing political struggle between the radical Republicans in Congress and the Lincoln administration and its senior leaders. Richardson appeared before the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War as Chandler and others sought to dismiss officers like McClellan, who they saw as too timid. Richardson and the president, however, enjoyed a friendly personal relationship. In March 1862, Richardson was promoted to divisional command in Edwin Sumner's Second Corps. He worked hard to prepare for the upcoming campaign. Richardson's leadership talents were on full display as he put to use all of the lessons from his long military service. I think in the modern term, Richardson would be someone that we call servant leadership. He's very devoted to the welfare of his men, to giving consideration to their comfort, their needs, and the belief that it is, if I've taken care of my men, made sure that they're fed, they're comfortable, they're going to be that much better of soldiers for me. Richardson stressed building a unit together and looking out for each other, which not all of his independently minded soldiers took to heart right away. Another story where they're washing up in, a, in the river and uh, uh, Richardson's down there naked with everybody else and he asked the guy for neighbor for a bar of soap. Bars of soap were, were, were tough to, to have at the time, so he kept the soap to himself and Richardson kind of scolded him saying, after you've been around for a while, you'll, you'll learn to share everything you have with your, with your friends. He climbs out on the riverbank and puts on his general's uniform and, and, and meanders away. As a new commander, Richardson was still unknown to most of the men, and his personal habits of dress were a surprise to them. Richardson was famous for walking around in civilian clothes or a private's blouse, and he was very, uh, he would be very coy with men, you know, especially if he ran into a pompous individual. You know, in one case, he had a junior officer that ran into him and treated him very disrespectfully, thinking that he was a teamster or a civilian or something like that. And the junior officer was on his way to see General Richardson, so... General Richardson made sure to put on his full dress uniform or his full coat, which is something he didn't do all the time, and uh, 
taught the young officer the value of respecting people and not just uh, being so pompous. <laughs> In April, Richardson and his men were part of the federal advance on Manassas Junction. There they found only abandoned Confederate works, but it gave the men their first taste of campaigning as a unit. Later in the month, Richardson's division embarked for Fort Monroe on the Virginia Peninsula. Throughout April and May, Richardson and his men sat through the siege of Yorktown and then moved into the siege lines around the Confederate capital of Richmond. Richardson discovered that his new command had remarkable potential. Crack units filled its ranks, the 5th New Hampshire, 57th New York, and the Irish Brigade, to name a few. And he had a cadre of talented subordinates who would make names for themselves in the war, including Francis Barlow, Nelson Miles, Patrick Kelly, Edward Cross, Samuel Zook, John Brooke, Oliver Howard, and Francis Marr. Richardson's a combat leader is really fascinating. You know, he build, starts off as a brigade commander and his brigade goes on to be one of, you know, a famous brigade in the Third Corps at Gettysburg. Uh, then commanded by Colonel de Trobian, they hold the Rosewoods for hours during the big assault on July 2nd. He goes on to command the 1st Division, 2nd Corps, which is arguably one of, the, one of the best combat divisions in the Army of the Potomac, if not the entire war. And the division gets really associated with Hancock later in the war, you know, Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. But Richardson is the first combat commander of that unit. He really crafts them. And it's an interesting unit because it's it's a delicate unit. It has the Irish Brigade, which is a it's a political, you know, it's it's kind of a political hot potato. And Richardson is a radical Republican, but he, you know, this very democratically leading brigade, he's able to relate to them. A lot of his ability as a leader to connect with those soldiers, to overcome any political issues. And he takes this very diverse division, fuses it together, and has an excellent combat record through the Seven Days, through Fair Oaks, and then famously at Antietam, where Richardson lead, you know, cracks the Confederate center before he's mortally wounded. Their first combat came at the end of May at Fair Oaks. The Confederates, under Joseph Johnson, launched an assault on the Erasmus Keys Union 4th Corps and Richardson's division made a hard march through the mud to reinforce the Union right. On the second day, they broke the Confederate assaults before Richardson launched a counterattack and regained the lost ground from the first day of the battle. During the Seven Days Battles, Richardson's division was in the thick of the action. Two of his brigades arrived in the nick of time at Gaines Mill and covered the Union withdrawal. At Savage Station, Richardson assumed the role as the Army's rear guard. The following day, at White Oak Swamp, he delayed Stonewall Jackson for an entire day. And at Malvern Hill, two of his brigades were sent to reinforce the men holding off the massed Confederates' assaults as they were on the verge of being overwhelmed. By the end of the campaign, Richardson was one of the rising stars of the Army, and his division had already established its reputation as a hard-fighting organization. He took a brief leave back to his home in Pontiac and was promoted to Major General. The Second Corps missed the Second Battle of Bull Run in August, but was on hand in Washington when the broken Federal armies poured back into the city a few days later. Once again, Lincoln turned to McClellan to pull the army together. A few days later, Richardson and his army marched out of the defenses with the rest of the Army of the Potomac. As they pressed into western Maryland, McClellan discovered Lee's plans through a dropped order and pressed to hit the Confederates while they were still divided. After delaying the Federals at South Mountain, Lee gathered his armies on the banks of Antietam Creek with his back to the Potomac River. The Federal assault began on the right, around the Dunker Church and the Cornfield. Soon, it was the Second Corps' turn. Richardson's division was last in line, and the divisions began to separate. Sumner personally guided the leading division forward towards the Dunker Church, and the newly formed 3rd Division veered off to the left toward Robert Rhodes' Confederates in the sunken lane. So what you have is, instead of a corps, which is three divisions fighting one fight together, uh, you get Sumner's Corps fighting basically two distinct fights. Robert Rhodes' division 
is pretty weakened by this point. They've just went through the Battle of South Mountain at Turner's Gap, and they're holding the Sunken Road position, which is an excellent natural trench. Well, Richardson's fight is uh, at a uh, place called uh, the Bloody Lane. He ties his unit into the, the back of the, the green division that's in front of it, and they turn and just start marching toward the Confederate line. Part of Richardson having a great division is excellent junior officers. One of them, Francis Barlow, who later commands the division, actually works works onto a small uh, hillock and is able to fire down into the road and break up the Confederates where they're, the Union's finally able to punch through. He's waiting for his troops to gather the troops up for one final push. He's brought in some artillery. To ask, he's asked for artillery and only gotten a battery or two. Desperate to fill the breach in his center, Lee rushed to find more troops. A handful of Confederate guns opened up and Richardson was placing his guns to counter them. James Longstreet, Richardson's friend from the old army days, even put his personal staff to work, manning a gun firing on the Union breakthrough. And Richardson gets wounded. The only wound he's had in 15 years is a, a artillery shell bursts overhead and a, a piece of shrapnel goes down apparently through the collarbone and a, a, a piece lodges in his lung. Richardson supposedly was in the process of trying to gather reserves together to launch one last attack uh, when he was mortally wounded. And of course, you know, there's always the supposition, you know, if he, had, if he hadn't been wounded then, what would have happened? He is um, taken to a field hospital initially right down nearby and then taken across Antietam Creek to the Philip Pry House where he convalesced. The wound seems to be healing, um, seems to be doing okay. However, infection sets in um, quickly, followed by pneumonia, and Israel Richardson dies in the Pry House on November 3rd. Richardson's death deeply affected the men with whom he had served. Whatever his faults, they understood the Army had lost a leader with a remarkable presence on the battlefield. Richardson never appeared well out of battle. But that in one, he was magnificent. Major General Edwin Sumner, 2nd Corps. I think one thing, you know, it's tragic to think about the what if of Richardson, you know, that he dies in the fall of 62, you know, as a senior major general. He certainly would have been a corps commander at Fredericksburg if he had lived, if not higher. You know, there's, of course, where would the trajectory of his career been? You know, the, the Army of the Potomac really lost out not only on a great combat commander, but a future corps commander, potentially a future army commander. You know, what did that mean for how long the war went? How many more people died because a commander like Richardson wasn't there at Chancellorsville or Gettysburg or something like that, where he really could have made a noticeable difference on the battlefield? Fighting Dick Richardson's reputation faded as the war progressed. His replacement in division command, Winfield Hancock, would take them to fame and later command the Second Corps. The junior officers that Richardson had raised and first led into combat would command it in turn. John Caldwell, Francis Barlow, and Nelson Miles. But the division was forever stamped with the aggressive spirit of the rough man from Michigan. But he understood too how to motivate, how to have his men understand the cause that they were fighting for. And, and it may not necessarily be the cause of freedom or the cause of liberty, but just the cause right there at the moment on the field of having an objective and working toward that objective. And before he launched his division on the sunken road, he had told his men, I will not send you where I will not go. And his men believed that firmly and his men would fight for him. Well, as we look at the life of Richardson from his childhood years through West Point, service in the Mexican War and on the Plains, and those leadership lessons he learned there, we see how he takes all of this as he becomes a preeminent battlefield commander during the Civil War up until the point when he's mortally wounded at the Battle of Antietam. Thanks for spending your time with Civil War Digital Digest. We hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Israel Richardson. We say thanks to the CWDD Coffee Grinders, our patrons over on Patreon. Consider joining us there. A little bit from everybody each month makes so much of this possible. We'll see you next time.